Thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. I'm Aaron Porras, here with ILTV's Morning Briefing. Five rockets launched from Syria have just struck Israeli territory. No casualties or damage has been reported, although one of the missiles hit very close to a major residential area. The IDF has retaliated by destroying three Syrian missile launchers and warned that more attacks will escalate Israel's response. At first, the missiles were believed to have been spillover from the Syrian civil war, but now suspicions are very high that these were deliberate attacks from the Syrian regime. The area the rockets came from is controlled by the Syrian military, and no fighting was going on there at any time. On top of that, the missiles didn't land close to the border at random, but rather deep inside Israeli territory one right after the other. This is the second exchange of blows in less than a week between Israel and Syria, and tensions have only been getting worse. Just a few days ago, Iran's military head met with Syrian President Assad and announced Iran would help Syria fight against their so-called enemy, the Zionist regime. Syria has taken to the United Nations over the latest retaliation, accusing Israel of faking Syria's attack to justify the counterstrike. In an official letter to the United Nations, Syria alleges that Israel actually asked other terror organizations to fire the rockets into Israel, skirting all blame for all five missiles. The IDF has already confirmed that the missiles were launched from Syria and clearly will not tolerate any aggression against the state of Israel. For those hopeful that the Palestinian reconciliation might ease tensions against Israel or promote peace, Hamas has some bad news for you. Hamas's leader in Gaza has just announced that, quote, over is the time Hamas spent discussing recognizing Israel. Now Hamas will discuss when we will wipe out Israel, end quote. These are obviously far from the words Israel has been hoping to hear, though they're not entirely unexpected. That's because both Israel and the United States have demanded that they'll only recognize a Palestinian unity government that fully disarms Hamas and recognizes Israel's right to exist. But giving up its massive army, the largest armed Palestinian force in the world, is something Hamas clearly refuses to do. Case in point, breaking another red line of the United States' demands, Hamas has just sent a team to Iran, hoping to strengthen ties. Many believe Iran will also help connect Hamas to Hezbollah as well as Syria, uniting against the common enemy of Israel. Despite these violations, an anonymous White House official remains strangely optimistic that the Palestinian unity deal might still prove fruitful for Israel. Though the official stresses that dismantling Hamas's army and renouncing violence remains a key requirement, the new opportunity in Gaza would help both parties, quote, if we can make something out of it, end quote. But with Hamas in Iran and its leader intent on annihilating the Jewish state, it remains to be seen if this will truly be a path to peace. A 12-year-old boy in the city of Hebron has just been injured in a stone-throwing attack, and the Palestinian assailant is still at large. In a video of the event that's being spread to help find the attacker, you can see the unidentified Palestinian throw a large stone down into a space where the victim and his friends were sitting. The Israeli boy who was hit in the head fell unconscious into a pool and had to be rescued by his friends who later called for emergency services. The boy arrived at Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem, received 10 stitches on the top of his head, and is in stable condition. The assailant escaped on foot. Hebron, which is both held holy and is home to both Israelis and Palestinians, has long been a flashpoint area of the West Bank. Interfaith relationships are still difficult for many people to accept these days, but there's one group of hardline anti-assimilationists in Israel that seem to take the cake. Israeli police today arrested 15 Jewish extremists from the Lehava group, including their leader, Bensi Gopstein, over charges of suspected assault and harassment of Arabs who dated Jewish women. The crew of arrested Lehava members was picked up from their homes and taken in for questioning by the police, who will reveal later which of them will have to appear in court. According to the police, the detainments were meant to cut off the phenomenon of assault on Arabs and prevent radicalization by members of the group and harming others on the basis of racist nationalism. The Israeli police will act wherever criminals are taking the law into their own hands. Though Lahava is openly against intermarriage, assimilation, and even public activity by non-Jews in Israel, Gopstein, Lahava's leader, claims the arrests are part of a leftist, extremist, and reform Jewish pressure being put on the police to arrest him unjustly. Many maintain, though, that A, Gopstein and many members of his organization have been arrested a number of times in the past for similar charges, B, there's an existing petition calling for Gopstein to be tried for incitement to violence and racism, and C, that many Israeli lawmakers have also already been trying to designate Lahav as a terrorist group. 
Regardless, the answer to what comes next now lies in the hands of the Israeli police. Finally, the incredible journey of a long-lost violin has finally come to an end. Fanny Hecht, a Jewish woman who tried to flee Nazi Germany during the Holocaust, had just one request when she and her family packed up and left in their attempts to escape. That her neighbor, a friend of hers who played music with her, would keep her precious belongings, most of all her violin, safe until her return. Well, her friend and neighbor Helena Visser kept that promise, and so did Helena's descendants over the next 74 years. The violin passed from hand to hand throughout the generations of Helena's family until it ended up in Canada with Art Boss and his sister Marley. Then recently, the pair and their families made their first trip to Israel, where they visited the Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial Museum and finally found out that there was no heir of the Hecht family to return the violin to. So they did the next best thing. After seeing an orchestral documentary about the Violins of Hope project, which collects violins taken from Jews in the Holocaust, restores them, and gives them to musicians to use in concerts, the Boss family contacted the force behind the project, Amnon Weinstein, who is a violin maker, artist, and a relative to many family members killed in the Holocaust. Weinstein said that while he's received a lot of violins in a lot of different ways, this is quote, the first time he'd encountered such a story. For Marley and Art, it was just an opportunity to bring to a conclusion this story that has been with their family for so many years. To quote, return the violin to Jewish hands, to restore it to use, and besides all of that, of course, to just visit Israel. End quote. That's all for now. I'm Aaron Porras, and see you later with our main daily broadcast from Israel at 2 p.m. Eastern Time.